Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and the sponsor for this episode is the Georgian Papers Program. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 173 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. You know, we don't really get a full picture of the history of North America unless we also look at the history of the Caribbean. Because when we look at the historical records that tell us about the past, we often find that the histories of North America and the Caribbean islands are intimately intertwined. And this makes sense. The same European empires that we encounter in our study of early North America also appear in the Caribbean. Spain, France, Great Britain, and the Netherlands all had Caribbean colonies. And these colonies often traded with their imperial counterparts on the mainland. And, of course, as we know from our exploration in episode 161, Smuggling in the American Revolution, the people of early North America and the various Caribbean islands also often traded outside of their imperial bounds. Now, when we think of trade, we often think of goods. But goods weren't the only thing that people traded between the islands and the mainland. They also traded people. People moved between the islands and the mainland, and they also moved from the mainland to the islands. And people also traded aspects of culture and many ideas between the islands and the mainland. Today, we're going to explore some of the connections between mainland British North America and one of Great Britain's Caribbean islands, Barbados. Specifically, we're going to explore connections in the practices of urban slavery between the two regions and in the historical records we have about these regions. Marisa Fuentes, a professor of history at Rutgers University, is going to help us explore these connections with details from her award-winning book, Dispossessed Lives, Enslaved Women, Violence, and the Archive. Now, during our exploration, Marisa reveals... Details about Bridgetown Barbados in the 18th century, differences between urban slavery and plantation slavery, and information about the historical records historians use to recover and reconstruct the lives of people from the past. But first, Ben Franklin's World has an e-newsletter. Each week, it places the show notes for the new episode right in your inbox. And every once in a while, I use it to send you timely news with information about a meetup or some other exciting happening. Signing up for the newsletter is really easy. Just text BF World to 33444. All right, are you ready to explore some of the connections between North America and the Caribbean? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of both women and gender studies and history at Rutgers University where she researches slavery, gender, and sexuality in the modern Atlantic world. She's also the author of the award-winning book, Dispossessed Lives, Enslaved Women, Violence, and the Archive. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Marisa Fuentes. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Dispossessed Lives is a really interesting book because it offers us a look at Caribbean slavery in an urban environment by exploring the urban slave society of Bridgetown, Barbados. Marisa, would you tell us about Bridgetown, Barbados in the 18th century? I mean, what does this urban area look like and what was its practice of slavery like? Sure. It was founded around 1630. The colony itself was settled in 1627. And then a few years later, Bridgetown was sort of made the central governing city of the colony. It moved from Hull Town, which was further up on the West Coast. So it was the first British Caribbean slave society to develop in that region. I think starting with the size of the town in comparison to other Atlantic port cities is a great place to start. And that would be comparable to a place like Boston, which it was just slightly smaller than. So it was a large bustling port town with busy shipping and export and import, both of enslaved people, but also goods such as sugar and rum and molasses. It resembled other port towns in the wider Atlantic world, and it was actually modeled on pre-1666 London. So the street layouts, the neighborhoods where sort of the merchant districts were, 
where enslaved people were concentrated, where perhaps wine was sold. They're all sort of mapped out in a way that modeled on pre-1666 London. And in terms of enslavement in the town, most people enslaved in the town labored in the domestic realm, so in the households, doing work such as laundry, seamstress work, child care. And that was primarily a sort of female enslaved role in the household, whereas enslaved men in Bridgetown primarily worked on the docks and in public work projects around town, fixing streets, picking up waste from the streets, but also doing a lot of work transporting people to and from the larger ships that were harbored in Carlisle Bay. Now, one of the curious things I found about your book, Dispossessed Lives, is that it's a study that focuses on urban slavery. And this is curious to me because when most historians study slavery in the 18th century Caribbean, they typically study the development of plantations and plantation economies. So would you tell us how urban slavery is different from plantation slavery in the 18th century Caribbean? Absolutely. Urban slavery was both similar and different to plantation slavery. Obviously, both geographies depended upon enslaved people to do the bulk of the heavy lifting of just everyday life. So similar to the plantation, and there was a domestic realm in which enslaved people labored both on the plantation and in the town. The, the differences would be that thinking about the plantation as a kind of complex with a very finite boundary around it, where enslaved people could not really leave the plantation without passes and without permission from planters and overseers, town life was much more fluid. Enslaved people often labored without the overseeing of their owners in particular. So they could go across town doing odd jobs, being hired out in a way that was much more fluid than on the plantation where it was more kind of regimented labor. So those are two kind of very vast differences. And of course, life expectancy. You know, when you think about plantation labor and you think about sugar in particular, sugar was a very hard crop to produce from the planting of it to the harvesting and the long season that it took. The historians often say that it was a particular agricultural production that shortened the life of enslaved people. So if you're arriving on a plantation and you're laboring on a sugar plantation, your life expectancy was between one and seven years. So it was a very deadly labor. In contrast to urban life, which enslaved people in an urban realm often had more access to a variety of food that was different from the plantation. Labor was difficult, but it was different. So it wasn't as hard on the body necessarily as working in sugar. You know, men did heavy lifting, loading and unloading ships. And that's a different kind of labor than cutting cane. The access to food becomes really important because enslaved people on plantations particularly sugar, were not necessarily given enough calories for the labor that they were required to do, whereas the daily cycle of labor in the urban context, one could do work in the morning, walk across town or do something else and then go back to work. So there was more of a kind of fluctuation in terms of laboring. So I would say that they had similarities because they were regulated in the same way, subject to the same laws and subject to the same types of punishment. But the actual labor was quite different on enslaved people's bodies. Now, as we know, urban slavery also existed and was practiced in many places and mainly in British North America, in places like Boston, New York City and Charleston. Marisa, were there any distinct differences between urban slavery as practiced in the Caribbean versus urban slavery as practiced in mainland North America? You know, I think the differences would be I don't think that they were vastly different, especially ports that, you know, the main industry was shipping and export or import. So Bridgetown was very similar to Charleston, for example, where they were both huge slave trading ports, large ports that had a constant influx of slave ships and shipping. So enslaved people were employed in the same way in both places, a place like Boston, right? So weather is going to affect types of labor and the ability to sort of labor around the clock and to labor through seasons. Obviously, you can't do everything you can in snow as you can when the weather is more mild as in the Caribbean. 
But I would say that they were very similar and perhaps differences in terms of numbers of people. You know, Bridgetown and Charleston had majority black populations in the 18th century and a place like Boston did not. So then enslaved life is going to be a bit different. Perhaps you would have more of an ability to form community and to be a little bit more buffered by and from white life in a place like Charleston or a place like Bridgetown. Whereas Boston, enslaved people could be intended to be a little bit more isolated because there were fewer of them. Okay, so in Dispossessed Lives, you specifically explore the experiences of enslaved women. Would you tell us about the experiences of enslaved women in 18th century Bridgetown, Barbados? And would you tell us why you chose to study women specifically? So I'll start with the latter. I chose to study women specifically because Barbados and Bridgetown had a very unique population in that women made up the majority of the population. And when I say women, I mean both black women and white women. So to think about studying slavery in a place where women are the majority changes the way we think about the role of men, patriarchy and power. And I thought it was a really rich site to explore the gendered nature of slavery and intragendered in particular, because Bridgetown also had a majority female population and white women were the majority slave owners in Bridgetown. So thinking about white women as slave owners also changes the way we think about slavery in the Atlantic world at this time. So it's a very unique place to think about gender and how gender affects one's enslavement. But the typical life, I think I alluded to that in another answer and thinking about the ways in which enslaved women labored in town. So obviously they were in the domestic realm. They were cooks. They were in charge of cleaning the household. They were doing the laundry. They were also hucksters. So hucksters is a word that means peddler. So many women were out in the street and in the market selling household wares to both local white Bridgetown residents, but also there were many, many people coming in and out of the town through shipping and sailors and military men. So all of these people circulating in town required particular goods that enslaved women primarily were responsible for selling. So domestic realm, the market, enslaved women also were involved in an informal economy, and that is prostitution, both in brothel houses and also owners who rented out their enslaved women for a particular amount of time to work for resident military men that were in town for months or a year to take care of their household needs, anywhere from dressing them to bathing them to making clothes to making food. But there was oftentimes an underlying intention of prostituting them to these men in hopes that they would become pregnant and then the owner would then have access to another property, right? Because they would own the children of these arrangements. So it's also a slightly different, again, from plantation labor in that women were hired out more often than they were on the plantation. And they had much more kind of mobility in that way. And I don't mean to say mobility as a kind of freedom, but perhaps they moved around more and perhaps they had more experience with different owners over their lifetime than they would on a plantation. Now, if you're really curious about how historians do research, then you should check out Dispossessed Lives, because Maurice's exploration and discussion of people goes hand in hand with her discussion of the archives she used to uncover and recover their stories. Marisa, would you tell us about the archives that you used to investigate the lives of Bridgetown's enslaved women? So I used archives that are typical for studying this era, for studying anybody in this era. But particularly when looking at enslaved people, you're not necessarily going to get sources that are produced by enslaved people. So most of the sources, if not the majority of what I looked at, were actually sources written by white people, slave owners, government officials, people that were slave owners or in control of law and the legal realm. I looked at probate records, so wills and deeds, exchange of property. I looked at government records, so the life of the colony when the council would meet or the assembly would meet and discuss the affairs of the island, either internally or in relationship to the kind of colonial mother in England or in relationship to other colonies that they were surrounded by, the French and the Spanish. 
I looked at colonial newspapers, which held many advertisements for the sale of enslaved people, but also advertisements for runaways, enslaved people that had run from anywhere on the island. And oftentimes they would run to town, so those records would repeat in the newspapers. And I actually had access to one novel about a particular kind of infamous person that I work with in the book. But all of these records are very typical of the era, and they're typical of people studying enslavement. What I didn't look at because I felt that it wouldn't necessarily get me closer to the experiences of the enslaved, which was the purpose of this book, is long letters between slave owners, although I did dabble in that. I really was concentrating on the kind of life of the town from a kind of public perspective. You know, what you're talking about are records that really just provide us with snippets and fragments of information about enslaved people's lives. So how do you go about interpreting these fragments of information from the historical record? I mean, these snippets often contain just a little bit of information, something as short as just the name of a person or the word Negro. So how do you use these fragments to find more information about the person mentioned in the record or about the world the person lived in? One way to do this, and I think my experience in the archive led me to question why there were so few sources or so few mentions of, you know, a kind of deep engagement of the lives of the enslaved. So obviously, if a person is experiencing life as a piece of property, they're not going to have information about them that tells you about their family life or their thoughts and feelings or perhaps where they're from whether they were born in Barbados or whether they were born in Africa and brought across. And those were the kinds of information that I really desired to be able to tell these stories and these life stories. So what I came across was mentions of women, whether they were being sold or whether they were being punished or whether they were being sought after like runaway advertisements. Perhaps they were captured and someone was saying, hey, I found an enslaved woman and she looks like this and you have to come get her and I'm putting her in the cage in town until the owner can come and look for them. So the place I started in trying to do this work was to really think about why. Why are the records so slim in regards to enslaved people's full lives? And that is kind of the explicit narrative that I write as I try to reconstruct these stories. So I talk about power and the power of enslaved owners to kind of write enslaved women into history in a particularly distorted way and the sort of tragedy of that loss. That becomes part of trying to recreate their lives, perhaps by talking about what we cannot find in the archive about them. But in terms of fragments, what I tried to do is to take a fragment and think about okay, we have some information about a person. We have perhaps what they looked like or perhaps where they were running to or perhaps, you know, they were caught up in the legal system and they were going to be executed. We have this snippet of information. What I pushed the boundaries of historical methods to do is to think about what is in the realm of possibility in this person's life by thinking about other enslaved people and the sort of kind of social history of enslavement in the Caribbean to fill out what was possible of a person's life and to think through the silences in the archive and the negative space. So, you know, thinking about how we could tell a story of a person as they move through space, what would they see? This could be anybody. This could be a planter. This could be a military man. We know what Bridgetown looked like. We have maps. We have travelers' accounts. We have all of this information. So it's not as if one is creating fiction. One can think about the other records that help give us context for what life was like. And then we can place that fragment in that context to kind of try to fill out what is possible in this particular geography, in this particular time period and experience. Each fragment that I worked with could tell a different story and require different methods to pull out more of a particular enslaved women's story. So I sort of use different methods in each chapter in order to kind of get out a story that the archive refused to reveal. I wonder if we could see this process of interpretation and contextualization that you just told us about in an example. Would you tell us about Jane and the historical sources that you use to get at the details about her life? 
Absolutely. I think that's the kind of perfect example of the methods that I use. So Jane was a runaway whose owner advertised for her return in one of the local newspapers. Her advertisement was particularly striking because it listed not necessarily what she looked like, but the marks on her body. So she was covered in scars. And the scars, the owner took very careful time to tell you what types of scars they were. So in the course of a very brief advertisement, we have what the owner calls country marks, which tend to be ethnic markings from a particular community in West Africa and how they identified themselves. She had whip marks from enslavement, from you know, being punished in a particular way. She had a brand, which tells you that she was likely a survivor of the Middle Passage and then marked with a brand for that particular company that was trading her, a merchant company. She also had a stab wound in her neck. So it just talks about all of these acts of violence on her body. But that is all. And that was what was striking about it. We'd know nothing else about her except for this one advertisement. So we don't know why she ran, where she ran, if she had family she was leaving or going to, how old she was, all the information that you desire as a historian of slavery. So what I decided to do, knowing the limitations of this particular fragment, was talk about how maybe the scars become another type of archive within the actual written record and how these scars produce meaning about her that historians often overlook. But then I pushed it more and I wanted to show you what life was like or what a day in the life of an enslaved runaway was like by taking Jane through town. This is the first chapter. So you're introduced to the book and you're introduced to Bridgetown through Jane's eyes. So I used maps and I used visitors' accounts. I used the history of the development of Bridgetown to tell a story that did not necessarily rely on the voice of her owner who made her into property and he was looking for his property. Rather, I took her through town and I talked about what she would pass and what she would see. I want to kind of emphasize this because, again, I'm not creating fiction. I'm using other records to situate her in a context. So everything that she would have seen and experienced was actually true if anybody walked through the town. And it was a way for me to decenter the voice of the archive and the voice of the owner and try to have the readers experience this through Jane's perspective. I think we should talk about this a bit more because, as you mentioned, you used one runaway ad to tell us about Jane and the world she lived in. And some of the information you just told us about is really speculative. So, Should historians speculate when they only have small amounts of information about something or someone from the past? And if they should speculate, how do they know when and how to speculate? So I would say this about speculation. I think all historians speculate. It is part of the process of telling a story about the past. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Thomas Jefferson or an indentured servant. There's an aspect of being a historian that is about speculation. When you're speculating and you're thinking about what is in the realm of possibility, when you're talking about particular historical subjects that are very vulnerable in their own lives, which makes them kind of invisible in the archive in particular ways, you want to think about filling out their story in ways that challenge historical methods that require you to have a vast amount of information. So that's sort of traditional historical methodology. You're required to have as many sources as possible to be able to make a definitive statement about something. But I'm asking us to consider that that actually does more to erase (laughs) enslaved women as subjects than if we took the time to think about other ways to tell their stories that don't rely on a vast empirical base. So one of the ways, you know, I do this is by, again, going back to my last answer, is thinking about ways to contextualize their lives by using other frames of reference and other types of sources that fill out the fragment that I have. But I want to say that the language that you use to speculate, I think we all do it. And I think that there's particular ways to do it that keep it 
tied to an archival source, but also give an indication that this is not absolutely in the archival source necessarily, but this was still true and possible for the time period and for the location. And some of these words you use or you'll come across in a particular historical monograph or an article is possibly, this was possible, or perhaps this, right? And those are tools to use to still really commit to telling a story that might be more difficult to tell. I'd like for us to look at one more example of this. Earlier, you mentioned that one of your sources was a fictional account of a rather infamous woman. After we take a moment to discuss our sponsor for this episode, the Georgian Papers Program, I'd like for you to tell us about that account and about that woman, Rachel Pringle Pogreen. History and archival work go hand in hand. Letters, journals, and diaries are just some of the key records historians use to understand the past. In fact, researchers spend hours examining and transcribing these records, all to help them see particular moments of the past better. And they spend lots of time and money traveling to archives to conduct their research, too. Now, though, research is getting a bit easier and a bit cheaper as more and more archives are digitizing their records and putting them up online so that anyone with a computer can access them. In fact, the Omohundro Institute, the producer of Ben Franklin's World, is a primary partner in one such project to put the entire archive of the Georgian monarchs online. Locked for over a century in the Round Tower at Windsor Castle, the papers of the King Georges, George I, II, III, and IV, as well as of King William IV and all their family members and advisors, are now in the process of being digitized. And historians have only seen a small fraction of what is in these some 350,000 items in the collection. The Georgian Papers program is actually a great opportunity for all fans of history, because soon you can explore these records for yourself, and you can help historians and archivists transcribe these handwritten documents as they continue to come up online. If you enjoy exploring handwritten historical documents, you should sign up to be among the first in the Omohundro Institute's team of citizen transcribers. To become a citizen transcriber, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash transcribe. Marisa, would you tell us about Rachel Pringle Polgreen and the fictional account you mentioned about her life? Who was Polgreen and how did you use a fictional account to get at the details of her actual and factual life? Rachel Pringle Polgreen was a free woman of color in Bridgetown in the 18th century. And she lived from the mid 18th century to about 1791. She was a person who was born into slavery. And there's a lot of myths surrounding her because although we have some records of her life, we don't have records of her early life. She was someone who became free and perhaps with an association with sailors who came to the island at various times. She became free and she also was able to purchase a home in Bridgetown and open a hotel, which she named the Royal Navy Hotel. So it shows you that she had an association with the Navy and the military. And in this hotel, she owned about 38 enslaved people, mostly women. So historians have inferred through her ownership of that many people in a hotel that she likely ran a brothel. And some other sources that I found have confirmed this. So she was able to make a living and not just make a living and eke by. She actually made a profit from selling enslaved women to other people for sexual services. And certainly with the volume of visitors to Bridgetown over the course of the 18th century, there were many people who engaged in this informal economy. The ways that historians have, I mean, obviously, this is a kind of remarkable story in that there are various pieces of archive that historians have used over and over again about her. And in a context where enslaved women and free women of color don't necessarily enter the archives in the ways that whites do or in the volume or with the quality of detail that their white counterparts would, Rachel Pringle Polgreen is unique in that she left a will. She left an estate inventory. She left newspaper advertisements. And there was also a novel that was written in the mid-19th century that was a person that lived during her time and kind of reflected back into life in the 18th century in Bridgetown and in Barbados in general. And he was a white man. He owned one of the local newspapers and he knew her. So he wrote a kind of account of her 
that talks about a very fascinating story where the Prince of England comes to visit, Prince William Henry comes to visit Barbados, and he stops through her brothel and spends a few days there with his fellow soldiers, and then they end up sort of ransacking the house in a kind of drunken brawl. Much of the inside of her brothel was destroyed, and the kind of audacity she had was to give him a bill for the damage. And this story circulated. So we don't have evidence that it happened, you know, exactly. But we do have evidence of her advertising around that time for lost items. And these lost items could have been things that were taken or thrown out the window from that particular scene. But that novelistic account from her being rescued by Captain Pringle, a captain in the Royal Navy, and him purchasing her freedom and setting her up in the Royal Navy Hotel have been gleaned onto by historians. And so they just reproduce this account over and over again. So what I did was think about, well, what does it mean to base history on a novel? And how much of that story is true, actually true? And I went back and tried to kind of verify aspects of the story, some of which I could and some of which I could not. But what was really striking about the story is that historians had used her as an example of resistance to the institution of slavery. She was able to overcome a situation of being enslaved and possibly abused by her master, who was also supposed to be her father, and make a life for herself that was comparable to a sort of middle-class white person at the same time. So that's a story of triumph that one could tell and something to kind of glean onto in a society that really did not allow for people of color or enslaved people to make much of their lives because of the system was so oppressive. So what I did was trouble the idea of resistance by thinking about, well, what exactly did her money rely on? And in so thinking about what does it mean to prostitute other people? So not only did you enslave them, but you are forcing them to engage in a sexual economy that they might not want to be engaged in so that your freedom and your agency depend upon the unfreedom and the lack of agency of enslaved people. Now, that to me is not necessarily a kind of rosy picture of what we consider resistance. So then you have to go into and think about, well, what does agency and resistance mean in this time period, given this complicated relationship and narrative? And how do we unpack or disassociate the word resistance from our notion of agency? And finally, is agency the only way we can think about the life of people enslaved and narratives of enslavement, which I think have been repeated throughout the historiography of slavery? So I was interested in kind of troubling these terms, using her as an example of it's very complicated to say someone, you know, had a kind of unproblematic success story based on just how much money she made and not look at how she made that money and who she oppressed in order to become who she became. It's clear from your research and from the way that you've just described the lives of Jane and Rachel that you have put a lot of thought into the archival records that we have as well as to the records that we don't have in our archives. Have you ever found any answers for why there seems to be a lot of silences or absences in our archives about enslaved women and free women of color? What actually brought me to this approach and this book and filling out these stories was that I was struck by how violent the archives were. So how enslaved people were coming into the archive in these sort of violent and distorted ways. And particularly Caribbean slavery was what I call a factory of violence. And that had to do with the type of labor people were asked to perform, but also life expectancy. It was a harsh climate to labor in. And the records actually say that it was cheaper for planters to purchase more people than to keep the ones healthy that they were enslaving. So if people are being treated as property in sort of really significantly violent ways, that planters are not recording them as humans. And because they're not, all the records that the planters and owners and merchants are leaving are going to record enslaved people as property in very brief ways, in ways that planters imagine and stereotype people of African descent. So you really have to think about unpacking the distortions that are left in the archive. And if one's life was not valued by you know, the white society at one's time, then the archive is going to 
absolutely reflect that devaluing and create lots and lots of gaping holes in enslaved people's lives because their lives were not interesting to their owners or merchants because they were only interested in how they could be used to make profit. So I think about the silences and I write about what does it mean to have these silences persist and how do we push back on the nature of this archive. And to follow up on this question in point, you note in your book that Dispossessed Lives is an ethical project that seeks to examine the archive and historical production, and that you also seek to demonstrate that history is a production as much as an accounting of the past. How exactly is Dispossessed Lives an ethical project, and how is history a production as much as an accounting of the past? By ethical project, I mean that I'm going to be attentive to how enslaved people, and particularly women, were vulnerable in their lives, and then be very conscious of not reproducing that vulnerability in my historical account of them. So this means things like paying attention to just merely repeating what the archive says, because I believe that in merely repeating the ways people were listed reproduces their objectification. So being very attentive to how we tell these stories. And in doing so, what are the methods that we use that actually reproduce some of the violence that comes through the archive? And as an example, if I'm writing a piece from a fragment that talks about an enslaved woman being beaten to death, am I merely going to reproduce the account from the witness who happens to be a white male? And that's one way one could tell the story is to say, you know, this sailor observed this woman being beaten and he intervened and he told the person to stop, but rather tell the story through the enslaved woman's perspective and what she might have seen as she was looking out. This is what I'm calling ethical because it actually takes into account the ways that we can not give voice because I don't think we could ever give voice to people in the past but at least change the perspective of how we look at a particular archival piece so that we consider first and foremost the perspective of an enslaved person who is written as an object in the archive, but we can turn them into a feeling, thinking subject just by the way we write about them and we interpret the archive. And what I mean by history as a production You know, I think about this as a historian, all of our work that we do, all of the histories we write is a production. And by production, I mean, we take archival pieces, we put them together, and we tell a narrative. But that's a process that we are curating and purposely thinking about, well, how do I tell this story, right? So we're using certain sources and we're not using other sources to make an argument and to have a kind of neat package narrative at the end. But that is to acknowledge that we are doing something to influence the way that the story is told. And I think that that's something that historians perhaps don't necessarily talk about in our work, but that is very important to think about how certain narratives get reproduced over and over again without thinking critically about, well, wait a second, what is actually being said? And can we look back at the archive and try to get at other perspectives that might challenge the narrative that we all take for granted. So those two together were efforts that I made in the book, both to kind of show how history is produced, but also to make very concerted effort not to re-objectify the enslaved women I was writing about. Our conversation has been really illuminating because we've not only uncovered and explored the lives of some of the enslaved and free women of color in 18th century Bridgetown, Barbados, But we've also looked at how Marisa has used historical records to uncover details about their lives. Marisa, you've detailed how historians interpret historical sources and produce history. Do you think there's a use for our knowledge about how historians interpret and produce history in the books, articles, and museum exhibit placards that they write that we can apply as we read those books, articles, and exhibit placards? Absolutely. I really do think that it's part of critical thinking. It's thinking about authorship and it's thinking about, you know, you mentioned placards at a museum. It's thinking about whose perspective is being represented, constantly kind of questioning what we're being told. And I think that that's a way to really get at, you know, what are the politics of certain narratives? What work do they do, especially in public history? 
So thinking about, I mean, certainly in this moment in time, what does a particular statue of someone represent? And how is it that there are competing narratives of what a particular statue represents in a public space? That is all about thinking critically about representation and thinking about the ways in which we have particular narratives, particularly famous people. So I'm thinking about Thomas Jefferson or George Washington and how we might take for granted that the historian takes for granted that these men wrote prolifically. We have lots of records about them. So we take their word as a kind of truth because they wrote it, they sought it. So it must be a representation of themselves rather than thinking about all of that representation that they do as them constructing themselves in a particular way and being more critical about even the most prolific people as we are perhaps with sort of thin sources. So I think we can take this and think about any history that we write or we read to kind of mine for, well, what is the project here and what is at stake here rather than just reading a kind of clean and neat narrative. And it's what I try to teach my students when I give them archival pieces to read, when they complain about, well, this person isn't telling me what they thought and felt. And I said, well, I wonder why not? And they have to think about, well, what went into making this source and why is this person disempowered in this particular moment in time? And why couldn't they have a source about them that was reflective of their experience? But that is a fuller story, right? It tells you about the conditions of their life. It tells you about the lack of voice they had in their own moment and the difficulties of retelling those stories. So I think it's really great to have a critical perspective of history and its production. Our exploration of enslaved women in Bridgetown, Barbados, has really taken us into the realm of vast early America, which is the idea that in order to best understand the history of early America, we need to study the history of not just North America, but of Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, and South America between the 15th and early 19th centuries, too. Marisa, in what ways do you think that knowing about the practice of slavery, specifically about the experiences of enslaved women in 18th century Barbados, helps us better understand the practice of slavery and the experiences of enslaved women in early North America and in the early United States? That's a great question. And I think one of the things that over time, I think it's changing a lot. And it's an example of this change is conceptualizing vast early America to think beyond national boundaries. The reality of the history of the Caribbean is that for a long time, and I mean, even to today, there was a lot of movement back and forth between the islands and the mainland. Certainly families migrated and they split. They kept in contact. The North American colonies often provided timber and foodstuffs for the islands who were really, really into sugar production. And so they cleared all their land and they didn't have wood. And they needed food because the land was not used for particularly mass quantities of food, but rather concentrated on sugar. So there's like an ongoing relationship that is really important to acknowledge because the Caribbean is going to influence the North American colonies. The North American colonies are going to influence the Caribbean in particular ways. And that's just the history of the place. So thinking about enslavement in a place like Barbados and particularly female enslavement, makes us look at a place like Charleston in a different way or maybe in a similar way in that were there a majority female enslaved population? What was it like to be an enslaved person in town? How did the colonial authorities think about punishment and control and confinement of an enslaved population in town since that was a different geography than the plantation? There's also, I think, usefulness in thinking about differences. So in a place like Boston, where there's fewer enslaved people, is there going to be a possibility to foment a rebellion in the same way as there would be in a place like Jamaica, where there's many more enslaved people and some enslaved people recognize each other via language or ethnic origin? So if you're isolated in Boston, you're going to have different possibilities than you would if you were in the Caribbean. But I guess emphasizing that this whole region has a relationship internally and across that I think is really logical and important for us to understand that when we study, you know, North America in isolation, it's actually not the full picture. It's thinking about Barbados during the American Revolution, 
and them being loyal to England as opposed to some of the other, you know, obviously North American colonies that rebelled. What does it mean to be loyal to England and have American ships coming in to your port, right? So you're going to have different kinds of anxieties, but that this region is completely connected all of the time. It's just more of a reality than cutting off geographies from each other to write historical pieces that are very specific. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if literacy rates had been higher among the enslaved people in the Caribbean? How would this change the nature of the historical sources that we have about the enslaved in their lives? And would the archives we create to conserve and preserve the historical records be different if enslaved people had created these records? So if enslaved people had had higher literacy rates, what would we know? Or how would we change the way we write up this history? I mean, I think if they had higher literacy rates, then we would understand that whatever system of slavery was in place was different than it was in the sugar industry where life was very short. So the quality of life might have been different. We can think about that. But I think you might be getting at, you know, what if enslaved people represented themselves more? I think that that we would be able to write fuller stories of people's lives and how they thought about their experience in relationship to the records that white owners and merchants and government officials created. It would be perhaps, you know, we could read them with each other and against each other to get a fuller picture. As it stands, we can think about the difference between having a history of slavery in the antebellum U.S. South, as opposed to some of these places in the Caribbean. When you do have slave narratives written by formerly enslaved people or enslaved people, but also coming into the 1930s and thinking about the WPA narrative. What does it mean when formerly enslaved people represent their experience? You still have to do critical work in those sources. You will have perhaps more information to draw from, and you know you can write fuller histories in that way. But I still think it's important to be critical of how somebody's representing their experience and in narratives that they write about themselves, what is going on at the time that they're writing. I think you can still apply a kind of critical eye to any sources from the past. But I do think that we would have more to draw from and we would be able to create a fuller picture of enslaved life. Marisa, what are you researching and writing about now? So now I'm writing or researching first and then writing a book that is going to look at the Atlantic slave trade in the 17th and 18th century. And I'm going to continue some of the questions that I had with the first book about ethical historical practice and writing from a deficit of sources or fragmented sources to think about equally overlooked historical subjects. So I'm concentrating on captive Africans who were brought across in the Middle Passage, but who arrived in ports like Bridgetown. Charleston, New York City, or Kingston, and actually weren't able to be sold because they were sick and dying. And they were called by the British in particular refuse slaves, so slaves that were considered disposable or garbage. And they've been overlooked in the history of the slave trade because they died. And one would think as a historian where there's nothing to say, right, because their lives end at the port. But instead, I'm scouring the records of the slave trade for little pieces of these people to kind of write a history about what does it mean to be disposable in this system that relies on a laboring body. And it talks and speaks to a bunch of different literatures on slavery, including capitalism and slavery that might not consider in this capitalist production, the production of waste or humans as waste. And I'm thinking about what does it mean to be a person who is in the process of dying who is not actually a slave anymore, who is not actually a commodity anymore, and think about filling out that condition, thinking about what does it mean to be in that condition. So really looking at people that were existing only in a debit column in the records of the slave trade and trying very hard to fill out their stories 
as much as possible when I don't have a name like I did for the first book, but we have a composite of experiences that we can draw attention to and perhaps let us think about the whole project and the whole economy of slavery in a different way. We have covered a lot of ground and a lot of big ideas today. How can we contact you if we have questions or want to explore some of these ideas further? You can contact me on Rutgers History website. My email is there. And you can also contact me via Twitter. And my handle is at Dr. Marisa JF, F as in Frank. And I'm happy to answer questions or talk further about any of this. Marisa Fuentes, thank you for helping us explore slavery in 18th century Barbados and for showing us how you used archives and historical sources to uncover and recover the stories of enslaved women. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Urban slavery differed from plantation slavery in that urban slaves experienced more fluid lives. They often labored without the direct oversight of their owners, and they had a less regimented workday than most of the enslaved people who labored on plantations would have had. Still, urban slaves did not have easy lives. They labored hard in domestic tasks, along the docks, and in public works projects. And they often experienced a higher turnover rate than the people who claimed ownership of them. As Marisa revealed, we can look at how urban slavery was practiced in Bridgetown, Barbados, and see a lot of similarities and connections between how people in mainland North America practiced urban slavery. As Marisa noted, there were a lot of similarities between Bridgetown and Charleston, South Carolina, you know, given the similarities in climates and slave majorities and bustling seaports. Yet, life in urban Boston proved to be a bit different. Now, while the work enslaved people performed in Boston proved very similar to that performed by enslaved men and women in Bridgetown, Boston winters certainly hindered its enslaved people's ability to work. Plus, as a minority population, forging communities would have been more difficult in Boston than it was in Bridgetown. However, our exploration of urban slavery in the Caribbean extended beyond the practice of slavery. Marisa also helped us explore the historical materials historians use to uncover and recover the past. Whether we're researching history or just reading about it, we need to keep in mind that history is a production. The past happened, history is made. For example, historians curate their work. They decide which information to include, which information to leave out, which records to explore, which archives to use, how to interpret the records that they find, and when they should speculate about the past in the absence of abundant information. Marisa asks us to be aware of this process. When we read a history book or source from the past, we need to ask who and why wrote the source that we're reading. Also, we shouldn't be afraid to ask what information a historian or person from the past left out of their account. As Marisa just showed us, the silences of the past can lead us to ask new questions and look at old sources in history books in a lot of new ways. Questions about silences in the records is what allowed Marisa to uncover and discover a lot of information about enslaved women in 18th century Bridgetown, Barbados. I mean, imagine what we'll discover if we start asking the question, what isn't this historian and source telling us? I think it's a really exciting thought. You can find more information about Marisa, her book, Dispossessed Lives, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 173. The Omahundro Institute would love your help in transcribing the handwritten historical documents of the Georgian Papers. To join their team of citizen transcribers, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash transcribe. Holly White has become very helpful with this podcast, and she helped behind the scenes of this episode, too. Thank you for all you do, Holly. Finally, will knowing more information about how historians produce history change how you view and read history? I'd love to know. So send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.